Welcome to the Aju. I'm your host, Beef Loaf. This show is being sponsored by our friends, Punky's Pizza and Pasta, located at 2600 South Wallace, my personal favorite eatery in the neighborhood. They have the best selection of pizzas and pastas as well, sandwiches and salads of any spot in Bridgeport. Currently, they have a terrific Monday night's only special, one medium cheese pizza for $12.99. No promo codes, no minimums. Just place the order after 3 p.m. And you get one medium cheese pizza for $12.99. Toppings can be added, but at their normal prices. Hit the website, punkyspizza.com, for all your carryout or delivery needs or to cater your next party. You can also call 312-842-2100. The Scarlotta family will take care of you. Punky's Pizza and Pasta. This show is also powered by you, loyal 108 supporter. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to tickle the undercarriage in the process. Like, comment, turn on notifications, and most definitely super chat, because that's how we paid and how we continue to make the content you know and love. Tonight's guest. He's been on the White Sox beat at MLB.com for 22 years. A Michigan man that was wearing low-hanging shorts long before Chris Webber. Scott Merkin, <laughs> welcome to the issue. <laughs> we, <laughs> I saw a lot low-hanging shorts. We had quite a uh, challenge just to get me on. If if the if the uh, image starts to drop a little bit, it's because I can't hold the phone anymore. So <laughs> it, it's like that uh, that movie. What was the movie Mel Gibson did a long time ago called Payback, where he has the guys, the security guys, like hold their bags up in the air until he tells them not to, and they finally drop. Yeah, this yeah, this is like feats of strength you're performing right here, Mark. That's what that's, that's right. what it kind of is right. holding the phone but up. I, but now, since I have it in my hand, I have to dip down to the Michigan championship shirt there too. So yeah. <laughs> I know it's coming. I know it's coming. Got a little bit of everything there. I actually <laughs> changed my shirt before this. <laughs> was I was I telling the truth or lying? Were you wearing the baggy shorts before Chris Webber? I, I'm, I'm, I, I assume that you I were. Was. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I wore baggy shorts, and I'm older than Chris Webber, so I think I was wearing it before Chris Webber and <laughs> Jalen Rose and Juan Howard and Ray. Wait, Ray Jackson, Ray Jackson? King. I almost, I almost combined that. I almost made a Ray King. Ray King was a pitcher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's exactly. I'm not going to dare to ask you who your favorite member of the Fab Five is. That's probably a, a, maybe an unanswerable question. I don't know. Uh, I, unless, I, I, you, I, unless you have one instantly. I have no idea. I'd probably go with Jalen. I think Jalen yeah. was like, I, I like, uh, I, if, I, if I can share this story, I don't think he'd care that I shared this story. You know, uh, Brooks Boyer was uh, a heck of a basketball player during his time. And I think for a, a while was like the leading three-point shooter. In Notre Dame history, I'm not sure if that still is. And he told the story. You know, he's from Michigan, so he told the story about being in this five star camp, and he was getting ready to guard this guy, and he was kind of skinny, and he had baggy shorts, and he's like, "I'll take this guy. This will be no problem." Guy makes two moves, goes around him, slams dunk, slam dunks. It was Jalen Rose. So he, <laughs> and then I believe Brooks was also on the court the first time Steve Fisher started the five freshmen together. It was at oh, Notre wow. Dame. Okay, so I didn't pretty, realize. I'm that. pretty sure Brooks was on that team. Yeah, so I've never been able to find footage, but I but I know it was that was the first time. I think Ray Jackson was the last of the five to start, so that right, was the first right. time all five were together in the same lineup. Oh wow! I, I, I we've had Brooks on the 108 podcast before a long great. time ago, and he told a bunch of uh, Jordan stories from the time yeah. he was working for the yeah, Bulls. Yeah, he's got some good ones. Yeah, but it, he has some great ones, and but he didn't tell any about him playing. We were trying to provoke him a little bit. I'm glad you were able to tell us one, Merck, because even like we we told him like. Let's get a pickup game together, and then you'll come out and play. And he said, "Boys, I'm too old to run around anymore. I'll, I'll play horse." That's that's all he said, and that's why horse Bologna's is probably good. <laughs> Bologna's in count says, "Give me Brooks Boyer versus Beefo. Stop sign basketball." He, I mean, he's got the size advantage over me, and he's a much better shooter than I am. So I'm probably struggling that. In that I'm sure he still got it, even though he's been in the corporate world for how many years now? Thirty years, something like yeah. that. I'm sure he still got that shot. I bet you you throw him out there and he banged, you know, uh, eight out of ten threes. Uh, unguarded, right. yeah, he'll, he'll probably knock those down. There's no question. We, we both we commiserated together the weekend when uh, Texas pummeled Michigan in football and NIU, who then lost to Buffalo, stunned uh, stunned Notre Dame in South Bend. So we both had a little little talk about that one. <laughs> Came down a little bit after the championship. I, That's I, right. I, I respect that. Uh, Merck, I wanted to talk a little White Sox with you to start here. Um, you often, I hear you on interviews and such, you often measure your career by how many managers you covered for the White Sox. My first question for you is how was it this season covering two different managers? You had the incumbent Pedro Grafal, and then you have Grady Sizemore taking the throne, uh, after Grafal is, uh, is let go. Can you tell me the, uh, the differences and similarities between the two? Yeah, let's see if I can go down the list. It was Ozzy eight years, uh, Robin five. Four for Ricky, so that's 17. Yep. Two for Tony and Cairo, so that's 19. Two for Grafo and then Sizemore, 21. And then my first year uh, was 03, Jerry Manuel. So I didn't know Jerry. I didn't know Jerry very well. I just got him at the last, you know. And actually, that team was in first place down to the last two weeks of uh, 
of the season, and I think they lost two at home in a in a after taking the first two in a four game set against Minnesota, and then Minnesota beat them at the Metrodome, and Minnesota ended up winning that division that year, and then Ozzy took over in 04. So Dis- disappointing team, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is the first time I've really had two managers, unless you count when Coop filled in for the two games when Ozzy left for Florida, yeah. or legitimately you count when uh, Miguel Cairo took over when Tony was battling cancer and thankfully successfully battled that and beat that. And now is with the team, you know, all the time as, as a front office member. And uh, it's interesting, different people, different perspective, different times of season. You know, I, I like Pedro. I don't know if I ever really got to know Pedro all that great. I mean, I knew him from covering him for two years and, you know, what, 120 games. It wasn't big get to 120 this year. We yeah. had our ups and downs. We, you know, like everyone does, there were some disagreements along the way. Um, I think Grady has added a little bit of a morale boost, and I'm not sure if that was Pedro's fault that it had dropped a little bit because of the fact that they were losing all the time. You know, they, I mean, when he was let go, it was in a, what, one in 22 stretch, right? And they had just finished, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, the 21 game losing streak. So, you know, morale's not going to be great if you're losing, unless you start with a 40 game winning streak and then lose 21 in a row. Right. Morale ain't going to be good when you lose 20, no matter what. How, and the clubhouse is very good, but that's that's another question. But, yeah, I like them both. I mean, I, I the only way I knew – I covered Grady, believe it or not. I covered Grady in 05. Okay, yeah, big when he was Thorne like and, Yeah, yeah big stud. Thorne in the side of the White Sox that year. Such and, a good uh, player. Such a good yeah, player before he got uh, hurt. Especially right? those, like, three years with Cleveland. You know, it's funny. Yeah. When he got hired, a lot of people talked about, oh, he played 162 games three straight years. And I think there's a certain level of respect from the players among that that, like – He's been there. He's done this. He gets it. He gets the day-to-day stuff. Right. And I think he's really been more about, you know, he wants to win. He doesn't go out there saying, well, geez, let's slip a coin and I hope we come out on top. And he's managing to win. But I think he's also managing to see what guys can do. And let's be honest, this was a really bad team. And they traded six guys at the deadline, right, who were contributing. So you can't expect from that point on they're going to go like, you know, 30 and 10 after that. Now, it's no excuse. I mean – my argument, and we've talked about this quite a bit in the press box, is we get they were kind of designed to not be great this year, but I don't know why they had to be historically bad. You know, that that's the question exactly. that needs to be answered and needs to be answered by Chris and Jerry and Josh Barfield and Gene Watson and Jin Wong and Brian Bannister. I can list the whole front office yes. for next time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Going into 25, because you don't want anything near this again next year. This was This is bad. It's bad when national media, who are great, it's great when they come out to cover the team, but not they're for coming out to the team saying, oh, I may have to stay another couple of days because they didn't lose, you know? I mean, so that, <laughs> right. that's not what you want your team to be known for. And and you know what? Front office people and manager, and I'm sorry, and players and former players have talked about that, about how they believe in Chris, but they have to get to this point where people come to say, we're going to the Sox to win. Right. Not hoping we have a chance, but going there to win and going there to get better. So, to make a long answer too late short now, but I like <laughs> I knew Grady from a player. I knew Grady from one interview I did with him in the off season. Actually he was with his kids at a soccer game when I interviewed oh, him nice. in the off season. And I knew him from seeing him around the clubhouse, you know, when he was a major league coach. But really I've gotten to know him a little better. Did a one on one with him recently and you know, a, a good dude, a competitor, and I think would do a good job if he were given this job. I'm not sure if that's gonna happen past the interim stage, but yeah, I, I think it's a different thing. I think Pedro, you know, it got to a point where you almost had to defend your work and defend your appearance as a manager, not physical, but, you know, as yeah. a manager. And it became almost more about, and I'm not casting aspersions because he's gone now. It's not right. his deal anymore. There's no reason to pile on after the fact. But, I, I mean, I, I think this was also done wrong and that it was portrayed as anything but a rebuild. Right. And I'm not sure... What if rebuilds are the thing anymore with the you know with the players so anti tanking mm-hmm. and putting those rules in? So you know, I mean, I think White Sox fans would have a much different perspective if they were thirty six and one twenty six, but getting the first pick overall in next year's draft, right? Right, there'd be more excitement for sure. Right. There, wouldn't, there wouldn't be this. Defe- as much, I mean, we'd be defeatist, but it wouldn't be as much. You know, we could so, be thinking, okay, we get something out of this. So I've enjoyed all the managers I've covered. I mean, like Jerry Manuel, I, I knew for one season, so didn't really get. Ozzy was the best. Ozzy was just a character. I mean, just some of the things that, you know, we talked about and just joked about. And, and it shouldn't be forgotten that he knows baseball inside and out, too. Right. He's a very yes. smart baseball guy. So 
But yeah, Pedro and Grady are different, but I think they're also different because it's different times of the year and different functions. You know, I, I pointed this out. Pedro was in the front office for, I think, like 10 years in like minor league directing role. And then he told this great story when he got hired the day of his press conference where he went to his family. He has three daughters, I want to say, and his wife, Allie, and said, I want to go for this dream, but this will change our family dynamic a little bit. I want to become a manager. And his daughters told him, you can't tell us to go for our dream if you won't go for yours. So go for it. So the guy you know, works 10 years to get his dream. First year on the job, he's 7 and 21 in April. So, I mean, you're really swimming upstream from that point on, right? And yeah. he's had, he had like two good runs in the two years that he was in charge. So I can understand. I will say the one different thing is he did something different than most managers post game. He spoke after the players. It's almost always manager first. Oh, okay. It took a little while to get to him. It took about a half hour until he was ready. So I will say Grady is more expedient for the media. That's for sure. He gets <laughs> he gets out there and gets it done. He's and when he says he's, when he says he's going pregame, he's going pregame. I mean, he's good. They're both you know good. I had a real good one on one with uh, Pedro the Wednesday that a lot of people thought he was going to go, which was the yeah. Wednesday before that road trip to Minnesota and Oakland where it went to 21 and they beat Oakland on a Tuesday night, I want to say. I think that's right, yeah. And he was great. I talked to him about, you know, if he thought he was any good at the job he was doing. I talked to him about if he thought, you know, kind of knowing that a move was in the offing. Right. If if he left this job, would he be able to get another one with this day with him forever? And he gave great answers. So, I mean, he was honest. I just think different personalities and different personalities sculpted by different times for the team too yeah absolutely i i agree with you 100 percent, scott because there's different pressures when you're grady popping in there after the thing is already blown up right. and it's just like well you're, uh, you're just trying to make the best of a tough situation here whereas it was pedro from the year before and he's been dealing with this for a while yeah that's yeah it's totally understandable there let me get like, you a couple uh, uh drinks I, from I the, out real, real quick the other night you know there was what a uh, bases loaded situation it was a lefty maybe it was tanner scott on the mound for the padres and Grady left Dominic Fletcher in. There, there weren't a lot of pinch hitting options. I think Moncada, assuming they can use him, uh, <laughs> hitting right here. But, yes. <laughs> but you know, Dominic has been a great defensive player in the short time that he's been playing right regularly, and they want to see what he can do offensively. Now, I would argue you're not going to make a value judgment in 15 games on a guy for the entire next season. Just like there's always the warning of don't base someone's skill just on what they do in spring training. Right. But I can see where Grady is saying, okay. He may not. He may get this guy. He may not. But we got to see what he can do because he's going to be one of our guys for next year. Absolutely. Yeah. You got to give him some rope here. Let me get to a right. couple of drinks uh, from the from the uh, commenters. Singer Sox. Sure. Thank you. He says uh, Pedro Grafal is a member of, Ham- of Hamas allegedly. Uh, no, he, I, I don't think he is, uh, Singer. But thank you for the drink. I appreciate you. <laughs> and then uh, my guy Baloney says, uh, please use the proceeds of tonight's super chats. For a phone stand for Merkman. Going to leave somebody with an arm worse than Benintendi. <laughs> so we're looking out for you. Thank you, Peter. I appreciate yeah, I do need a, I do need, I don't, I'm trying, I'm looking at my place to try and find something to prop it up. And anything I can think of to prop up is going to give like a weird look up on my nostrils. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you know, it's up to you, Merk. I, I don't know if you want a weird nostril. Look. Anyway, uh, we, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the clubhouse there with, with discussion with, uh, with Grady and, and Pedro. Right. Jeff Passan recently put out an article at ESPN where he portrayed sort of an upbeat tenor in the White Sox clubhouse. Is that kind of what you've noticed, Merck, from the players, is that they're more upbeat than you think they would be for a team that's trending towards an all-time record of losses? Yeah, I think all credit to Jeff. I mean, but we've been writing kind of the similar thing all year. Jeff just did a deeper dive of a 24-hour period. And, he's, and Jeff's great, obviously. But, I mean, you know, we, I, we, I think – We've been getting scorned for that all year by saying <laughs> how great else. the clubhouse has been, and it really yeah. has been. You know, I think it's been considerably better than last year. It really has. You know, I mean, and I think that's made a difference. And players have talked about that over and over again about how they've stuck together. Corey Lee, who's become kind of a voice of that team, which is kind of cool to see. Uh, he talked yesterday about how guys always have each other's back, both on and off the field. So I, I think it's it's cool to see. And if that was one of Chris's goals, now when he says build a culture, I don't think he wanted just guys who can, you know, play video games together and play cards together and go right. fishing on the off day. He wants them to win as a team too, but <laughs> exactly. that may take a little bit. You know, they weren't in the best of position coming in and, uh, you know, it's tough, but it's, it's a really good clubhouse. It really is. There's no infighting. There's no finger pointing. And I guess it could easily go that way, right, with a team – 
second straight year losing over 100 and now you know one loss away from arguably being i don't want to say the worst pro sport team of all time but the most losses in a single season right of a pro lo- pro sport team of all time yeah absolutely no and that, that, you're, that's a question for for the guy people watching out there we've yeah. discussed this what what's going to be worse Sox I love that th- this discussion go up but what's going to be worse if they finish with 120 say 124 losses just a round number yeah. that or the Cleveland Lions and Bucks team that all went winless in the NFL which which one of those is a worse season? Do you consider overall the the winless season? In my opinion, you I think mean, so? I, yeah, okay. I would think the winless seasons are worse. I mean, I, Not I, I think the only I the only difference is the Bucks were what fourteen, and I think the Lions were sixteen, and maybe the Browns were seventeen. So it's a lot less than one sixty two. Obviously, <laughs> we were yeah. talking about this the other day. There was a, a great old coach. I don't know if you know his name, John McKay. Yeah, he was a, a star. Yeah. yeah, star at USC, and then went to the Bucks, and during that winless season, uh. Someone asked him, I'm, I think I'm paraphrasing, but someone asked him, what do you think of your team's execution? And he said, I'm all for it. <laughs> so that, that, that's <laughs> yeah, that could be applied in some ways to this White Sox team in certain yeah. instances because that's, now, been, now that's, that's been tough. Now, that's one thing that has not gone up to what Chris said. You know, Chris talked again about being a better fundamental team, being a better defensive team, and that has not played out at all this year. So right. they have they have developed a good core, and maybe three or four years from now, they knock on wood when this team is contending. They can look back at 24 and say, oh, that year hurt just as bad as 23. But we had guys who helped kind of build the precepts of what we wanted in this organization. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of guys who uh, I would consider is a major part of the core, Luis Robert Jr. is having an absolutely brutal year, Merck. And his first several years, whether uh, marred by injury or not, he was pretty much uh, an all-star. I mean, like that, that was the, the caliber of play. This year, it's fallen down quite a bit. You know, how is he dealing with that in the locker room? How, when you when you interact with him, how is he dealing with the fact that he's having the worst year of his career? He's been good. He's You know, he talks with um, Billy Russo, is, 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 does the interpreting. You know, I mean, I think Luis has a pretty good working knowledge of English, but, you know, I, I understand he feels much more comfortable doing the interviews with Billy, and I totally get that. Yeah. Um, he's been fine, you know. I, I see him interacting with other players. I think he is an influence on some of the younger players there. I see him talking to Miguel Vargas, and, of course, Moncada is now back in his locker, you know, back at, for at least three games next to Robert back there. You know, it's interesting because Robert came off legitimately one of the more complete seasons in White Sox history in 23, right? Yep. 38 homers, 36 doubles, 20 stolen bases. I think 90 runs scored, 86 RBIs, whatever it was, gold glove caliber defense. And for whatever reason, it just has not been there. He's gone a while without a home run right now. Yeah. You know, Grady pointed out, and Grady again knows this from being a player that serious injury you know I, I was there in kansas city when he rounded first and you're like oh boy you know here we go yeah. and fought his way back and wasn't like you know like oh he's got a hamstring pull we'll see you in two weeks maybe three weeks maybe a month this right. is a few months of rehab to get back then he comes back and deals with all the trade rumors you know so yeah. it probably was not the easiest year now i guess the people would argue and there's a lot of people arguing this year and understandably so i get it i've said that in my newsletters, in my articles, I get the fans' ire and disgust this year 100%. But they would argue, well, he gets paid to perform, right? And right. he needs to work around that. But I just think it's one of those years where he's expanded the zone a little bit. He's chased more, which he did not do last year. And people forget he started off slow last year yeah. and then crushed it. But I, I still would bet on Luis Robert, you know, 10 out of 10 times. I, I think, <laughs> you know, whether it's with the Sox next year, and I think it will be at least at the start with the White Sox next year or whether they move him to somewhere else, I think he's going to be a contributor. And he's he's a force. He's as talented. I mean, he's in the team picture for the most talented, raw talent guys in the game. You know, yes, can hit agreed. for power, hit for average, can throw, can play defense, can run. There's not much he can't do. So, you know, I think he really kind of gets the game and he's just having a bad year since he's come back from being hurt. Yeah, well, that's what I worry about, Mark. He's one of my favorite players, and I find myself defending him a lot because people will say, Oh, well, he's giving up on the team, and I'm like bullshit. I see him out there making diving yeah. catches. I see him stealing bases. You know when he, when the power's not there, and he's trying to contribute in any way he can. And I feel bad because when you look down the line, and you're like, well, this is a record losing team here. That's the superstar. He's got to feel extra pressure on himself. That like, man, this is my fault to some extent because I'm the only one who's like a real star in this offense. Well, especially because there's no offense, right? Right. The yeah. offense has been bad, very bad, record setting bad. Yep. I think like one of the worst OB OPSs and OBPs in baseball history. 
as a team. So he's the guy, right? So he's probably putting extra pressure on himself to drive in yeah. four with one guy on base. You know, so that <laughs> exactly. that makes a difference too. And then remember, he wasn't the only one hurt. You know, Aloy was hurt. Moncada was hurt. Yep. Benatendi and Vaughn had very slow starts to the whole first half, pretty much, right? Yeah, they started so, off I mean, real bad. Yeah. It, yeah, it was just a a very, you know, it's the Sox came in with no room for error and had nothing but error since this basically the first week of the season, right? I think Aloy got hurt three games in, something like that. Yeah, that's right. And Robert was April 9th, and I think Moncada was April 11th. So, I mean, by the end of 10 days, it was like, oh boy, here we go. You know, best players are out. (laughs) Yeah, I would still, I would still bet on Robert. I I would still say this guy is going to be a force and a force for many years to come. Absolutely. Speaking of guys, I want to bet on in the future. uh, To me, Brian Ramos is an impressive young kid. There's no betting. There's no betting on baseball. Not for me, at least. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Figuratively, I would, I would say, I would bet Luis Robert is going to be outstanding. How about that? Yes, uh, yeah, right, right, exactly. And hey, no, uh, no we think this person will do well. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly right. Um, it, it uh, my guy Brian Ramos, he's an impressive young man. Uh, it seems like uh, every time he services on the roster, you guys, the beat does go to him for uh, quotes and everything. Do you think he's an integral part of of the twenty twenty five team? He has some great stories. I mean, you know how he kind of worked to learn English, and uh, I was told by someone in the organization that one of the ways he helped or he picked up English was he listened to a rapper named Lil Baby, who I've never heard of before, but I looked up and there is someone named that who I'm sure makes a fortune doing what he's doing. And then the fact that he became a U.S., you know, he studied and became a U.S. citizen. Yeah. It was very cool. We talked to him and he told us that for the citizenship test, you needed seven out of 10 to become, to pass. And he paused and said, smiled and said, I got 10 out of 10. You know, so he was, <laughs> you can tell he's very proud. Great kid, beloved throughout that organization, very highly respected. They have an interesting decision to make, though, because they have Vargas, who was the cornerstone of the trade, you know, the the three-player trade they acquired from the Dodgers, and Ramos, who are both third basemen. You have Colson Montgomery, who's right now a shortstop, 100%, but some people think maybe a a third baseman at some point, certainly not a second baseman. Yep. So you got to figure out what you're going to do, right? You got to figure out how you're going to. Both Vargas, now Vargas has played other positions. Ramos has done some pregame work in the outfield. Ramos has played second in the minors. So maybe you look at that. But see, now that would be my argument when they talk about, well, we can't play Moncada in the last couple of weeks because Vargas and Ramos are our future. And Moncada is well aware that the Sox, you know, they're not picking up. I'm not even going to make a comparison. They're not picking up the $25 million option. They're going to use the $5 million buyout and he'll become a free agent. When I talked to him with Billy the other day, he mentioned that he's got a lot of years left, but he has to wait until free agency starts to see what the next step is. But if you're going to do that, why not play Ramos? Give him a couple games at second base. Just see. Or give him a game in left field just to see. Again, you don't want to, you know, crush the kid's confidence, but send him out there and just say, hey, whatever happens, we just want to see what you can do out there. Take the skills you've, you've worked on and show us what you got. I mean, Andrew Vaughn played second base. In a game in Kansas City, Andrew Vaughn right. became the out, a right fielder, having worked at um, what's it called the satellite camp during the COVID year. Yeah, and then like yep. three days after Roy hurt himself at the end of spring training. So I mean, <laughs> that would be my argument: is if you're going to use the guys now who are your future, then not you know just go willy nilly and like have Ben Attendee catch one day. But I mean, <laughs> right. let Ramos well, try. take a look, see a little yeah. bit of some of this stuff. You know, like, Great. Grady has said he wants Vargas at third. So let Ramos move around a little bit and see what he can do. Because I think he's a great guy to have in that clubhouse. And I think he's going to hit for power too. I think, and I think he's, I think he's probably the better third baseman between him and Vargas right now. So we'll see what ends up coming out of that. But uh, yeah, I agree with you. He's, he's a good guy to talk to. He's very pleasant, very upbeat. Just really seems to enjoy, not that everyone else isn't either, but really seems to enjoy being a professional baseball player. <laughs> I love it. I, yeah, I'm, I'm enthused every time he's out on the field or whatever. He looks like he has great joy out there playing as well. So that's that's pretty cool. That, that Just to tell you, so, time, so, so far the arm is doing okay. I'm worried about the elbow, though, by the time we're done here. <laughs> Oh, I might have to pay for uh, for uh, some uh, medical bills with the elbow. That's right. right. We'll see how it comes. Uh, um, Heading, you know, uh, Chris Getz has been extremely frank lately, talking about the team, the approach, heading into the offseason and everything. Merck, what do you expect uh, with regards to free agency? And what do you expect uh, with regards to additional shakeups potentially in the front office? Because Getz has been out here saying basically the, tr- you know, the truth is the way it lays, and it's pretty rare yeah. for a, a GM to do this. 
Yeah, I think that it bothered people the way it came out, but I I don't think it's anything that he hadn't said before, really. I mean, I don't think anyone was like, well, they're going to lose 125, but man, I can't wait till they get in the Juan Soto sweepstakes. You know, I, I don't <laughs> think that was happening. You know, so I, I think they're going to, they'll have to add some people, but I think it'll be kind of what they added last year too. I, I don't know if they'll even be, to, to use a comparison to like another rebuild in town, I don't even know if it'll be like when Edwin Jackson signed with the, the Cubs. I don't think you'll even see something of that level. Okay. But you look across, you know, the AL Central and you see the Royals, switching hands here, by the way, who, uh, <laughs> you know, who spend very wisely this offseason, did not yeah. go crazy, but added a lot of key pieces. Now they've kind of faded down the stretch a little bit, but they were great. I think they missed Pasquantino, who yeah. got hurt. But I mean, Waka, um, Lugo is probably going to be, you know, get Cy Young consideration. Yeah. The guy they traded for from Oakland, even adding Guriel, Tommy yeah. Pham has been a nice addition. So you don't have to go out and spend $300 million to make yourself a good team. You just got to identify the guys who are going to fit. With that said, I'm not even sure the Sox are going to do that. I think Getz is still adding on to his group. But again, yeah. you have to understand, better or worse, this is the second year of a rebuild. So I think what Chris was really trying to say was, and I don't put words in his mouth because I'm sure he'll do his season ender here in you know, one of these three days coming up in the Angels series. But I think he was trying to say, you know, we're developing these young guys. There are going to be more young guys at the big league level next year. And we need to see what they have before we go add pieces. So right. now I would argue if you have the money, you can add pieces and still develop the guys, but <laughs> True. that may not be the case for them. So I, I don't, you know, expect them to be big into free agency. I think their biggest move of the off season is going to be whoever they decide, you know, at some point in October or early November to hire his manager. I, I, I think I agree with you. I mean, they're going to use the utility of 7,000 plate appearances and 1,450 innings to see what they have kind of in the house for the most yeah. part and, and, and then start dealing with it. Uh, they, don't right have, after. they don't have young guys to cover every spot, so right. they're going to have True. to add, you know, some veterans. They're going to have, and I don't know if that's packaging. You know, they have a ton of pitching, a ton as in like comparative to their position players, talent coming up in the system, but right. they do have – nine to 11, 10 to 12 guys who you look at and say, yeah, at some level, these guys are going to help, whether it's in the rotation, in the bullpen, whatever it is. So maybe you package a couple of them and go get offense with that. You know, maybe, maybe yeah. you identify who are the core, who's that next level. And then from there you make moves and add on, but you know, I could see them, you know, adding a couple free agents to help fill things out too, because I don't think they're, I don't think it's going to be a completely young team next year. Yeah, no, yeah, I agree with you. I think they'll do a little bit, but it's there, but it's not. They're not going to be signing guys to four year deals. Is my thing? No, it's going to be one, one year flip here, and you know, maybe with a with a club option or something like that. That would be what I would expect. Something like those ones. <laughs> so uh, going back to the Jeff Passan article, he brought up something that I hadn't seen out there before, and maybe you guys on the beat kind of did know this, but because of the positioning in the front office, it wasn't re really sort of a a, a big uh, you know uh, discussion point, but. Uh, the White Sox brought in former Navy SEAL Brian Mahler into the uh, into the yeah. organization. Uh, do you have any specifics on what he does? I was even looking for a picture of this guy, and the best I could find was him playing uh, lacrosse at Harvard a million years ago. And you can't even see his face. I'm like, is this guy being protected by the government? Is that why I can't find a picture of him? So I was curious what you know about the guy, Mark. Yeah, I haven't really talked to him much. He's been there since the beginning of the season, though. This was not like a hire okay. that happened two weeks ago. And the people I talked to who have dealt with him, you know, love him. So okay. I think they really like what he's presenting. You know, I, I think he's part of the whole process to kind of reconfigure this. And Chris has talked about this and Chris has talked about building better infrastructure and just building a, a way, you know, top to bottom. But here's the thing. Like, I, I think Brian was a good hire. Like I said, the people who I've talked to him have worked with him. I know him far better than me. Rave reviews about what he's done for the organization so far. What, what he's added to the organization. I don't know about done yet, but yeah, the bottom line is you can build the infrastructure you can add on analytics. You can develop a farm system. It all comes, you got to win. I, I, Sox fans have just dealt with way. You know, I will tell. I've told this story thirty times. I'll tell thirty-one. But you know, I was there when Yohan Moncada made his debut for the White Sox in the last rebuild and had like a six-pitch at bat and fouled the pitch off and got a standing ovation. I was there when I was given the ovation. I was yeah, I was in the house. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure you were. I was there when uh, Michael Kopech was announced on Twitter on a Sunday that he was starting on a Tuesday and people went nuts. Fans deserve a ton. They embraced every step of that rebuild and they got two playoff wins out of the whole thing. Yeah. So you can talk infrastructure, you can talk building, you can talk developing, you can talk improving everything. 
ultimately you got to put it at the top of your chart and circle it. I just made a circle motion. You can't see it on here though. Uh, how do we win? How do we win and how do we win consistently? And I think Sox fans would even take win for a year at this point, right? Yes. I mean, I, I don't. I think if you told Sox fans you're going to lose 125, but you're going to make the LCS the next year, I think they'd be okay with that. 100%. You know? I think a lot of fans would be okay with that, actually. Probably. But, but yeah, that's the thing. It's all great to have a plan, but you got to execute that plan and execute it to the point of winning and winning consistently. <laughs> totally agree. We, we talked a little bit about Grady earlier. Were you surprised how candid he was about Yoan Mankata's situation and with regards to uh, Ramos and Vargas? Because speaking of this team, like Getz has been talking very frankly. And to me, Grady was extremely frank about how that was going to work. He did not like do the old PR thing where he tried to talk around it. He basically said, look, Mankata's going to sit. These guys are going to play. We'll see if we can get Mankata in there. I mean, I, I wasn't that surprised by that. I was more surprised by how Frank Moncada was when I talked to him with Billy on Friday in San Diego. Okay. He was yeah, basically yeah, saying, that. like, you know, I was hurt. I thought it'd be back to playing when I came here, and it's not. I don't really know what they want, but, you know, it's not my call, and I'm just here. So I, 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 I know he probably did not expect to come in there, and what was he back for? He was back for the road trip, right? So yeah. what was that, like 15 games total? Yeah, like 15 games. So I assume he didn't expect he was going to get 60 at bats in those 15 games, right. but I also don't think he expected to get one pinch running appearance and one, you know, ensuing it back because he stayed in the game. So I was more yeah. surprised by how direct Moncada was. You know, he was he wasn't, yeah. you know, in their face, but he was kind of like, yeah, I don't get it. You know, I mean, but he yeah. was also saying it's not my decision, so I'm just here to do what they ask me to do, pretty much. But yeah, there was in, no in your interview, Merck, there was a, a level of disappointment. He disappointed yeah. not being out there to play, even though the team is bad or whatever. He wants to be out there to contribute. It's obvious, you know. I would say this. I get that, you know, it took a while to, for him to come back from his injury. His injury was not, you know, a mild one. I mean, you saw the replays that he was yeah. doubled over and, you know, on the ground, not even doubled over. He was on the ground in pain in Cleveland when he hurt himself running to first base. Ultimately, it's a player who knows how he feels, and if he says he's not ready, then you gotta go with the player. But I'll go back to the same thing. I totally get that Vargas and Ramos and uh, maybe even Amaya, who's playing short, are part of the future, Fletcher and Wright. But again, I think we're talking, you know, 15 games. Now we're talking six games. So if, if this happened, like, with 60 games left, I could see where they would say, well, he's not going to play a lot because we got to get – I mean, it's it's 15 games, 9 games, 12 games, 6 games. But again – not my call. You know, I'm not the GM, nor am I the manager of that team. So I trust what they're doing. And even Moncada said not even his call. So he's just going with what he's got. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's understandable. You mentioned it previously that you thought probably the big uh, move this offseason is going to be the White Sox uh, in the manager search. Uh, question for you. Uh, how quickly do you expect Gets to hire the person? And then who do you, what do you expect in the candidate? Is there anything in particular you're thinking about like that they, they seem to want or that they want to bring in? I really have not heard a ton. I, I've heard that it will be someone, you know, a little bit more analytically inclined, but I think Pedro was analytically inclined when he came in, you know? Right, yeah. So, and Tony, in his own way, kind of helped develop analytics, right? When he was the that manager of Oakland. Yeah, yeah way back when. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, using certain guys for certain roles and that kind of thing. So yeah. I think that has something to do with it, but I don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a gut feeling. It's been very quiet. Now, I don't know if they're just putting a list together, checking with everyone they know to make sure they get the right candidates. And then once the season ends Sunday, they really go hard after it and, you know, try and get it done in the next three or four weeks. I think Pedro was hired, I want to say like November 2nd. So it could That's take right, the man. entirety of October. I mean, Skip Schumacher has connections to Tony LaRusa from his playing days. Right. It appears he's not going to stay in Florida. It also appears he's going to be a very popular candidate. So does he want to go? The Reds just dumped their manager too. So you right. know, I mean, there's other jobs that are going to be available. You know, does he want to go from Florida, which was a brutal situation, to the White Sox, which doesn't look a ton better right now? So you know, although <laughs> both teams have some players coming, so that that's the question. But yeah, I don't. I wish I could give you like four names that I know, but I, I you know, I've heard more that guys who probably aren't going to be it than guys who are going to be definitely in the running for it so far. <laughs> That's interesting. Now, there's no rules against them hiring during the playoffs. Is there, Merck? Like, they, they can. I think it's just not the uh, World Series week. or Like, what right, are the, kind of they, the blackouts restrictions? Yeah, I think they don't usually do it like LCS or World Series. But you can okay. do it, I think, on the off days and that kind of thing. Understandably, baseball likes its focus to be on the main, the crown jewels when it comes, right? So Absolutely. I, I don't even know if there's, like, an official rule on that. I think teams just don't do it usually. Makes sense. 
Uh, does Garrett Crochet get traded this offseason, Mark? Uh, wow, that's a great question. <laughs> um, you know, I would say, in my opinion, you don't. Because, man, if you have Garrett Crochet and Hagen Smith and you have – uh, Noah Schultz and Jonathan Cannon and Sean Burke and Davis Martin. You got a pretty young, pretty good crew there. You do. The problem is, though, you know, that it looks like Garrett is going to probably end up wanting to go to free agency, which is understandable. He had a great first year as a starting pitcher, probably going to even get better. So are you going to be good in the two years of control you have him? And if not, is that another way by trading Garrett? You know, they had some really good offers that I heard and some good interest in him right down to the wire. They just couldn't get the complete package that they wanted. So is that a way to, you know, improve your offense by trading for guys there, by trading Garrett Crochet? It, it, it's tough because, man, you're trading Garrett Crochet to find Garrett Crochet, basically, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, you're hoping you, you have another Garrett Crochet come along to right, lead the staff is right. what you're hoping for, right? I mean, he's he's tremendous. He's had, he's you know, I think if the team was better – not even like good, just better. He'd be looked at as one of the better. I mean, we have there's two pitching stories in Chicago overall: uh, Crochet and Imanaga, who have been two of the better stories in baseball this year, right? I mean, Absolutely. they've been yep. phenomenal. They've been phenomenal. So, you know, I think he's going to end up going though. I, I think he will, but I think okay. it's not a slam dunk because he's just he means so much, and he really works with the younger hitters, and he's. Uh, you know he he's a he's a good guy he, he's a good guy in the clubhouse and just a uh, sorry someone's calling me <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and just a uh, and I see him a lot of times talking with Cannon I see him talking with um what am I I'm blanking on his name the guy they got why am I blanking on the pitcher from San Diego who had uh, surgery Drew, uh, Drew Thorpe Drew Thorpe oh my god <laughs> uh, I think my arm is like my arms are so sore that I'm. <laughs> I'm losing focus. We're almost there. We're almost there. <laughs> They're all, you know, you see I'm talking a lot. So abundantly beneficial to keep Garrett Crochet, but they have to weigh the cost of, you know, if you're just going to have him for two years, does it make more sense to get more for him now? So that that's right. one of the many, many decisions Chris in the front office will have to encounter. Absolutely. Uh, do they trade uh, Luis Robert Jr. this offseason? I, I think they listen. You know, Chris has made it clear from last year at the GM meetings in Arizona that, no one is untouchable, but I don't know with the year he's had, which has been a down year, which he would admit to, yeah. and the injury that he had, if it's going to be a slam dunk that he's going to be gone. I, I would, I would bet that he start. He's got one year left, and then I think two twenty million dollar options, if I'm remembering right. I think that's so right. Yep. So you have potential for three years control. So even if you keep him into the trade deadline, you can still probably get a pretty good return if that's what you choose to do. I, I would guess right now he starts the season with the White Sox. Yeah, you're, you're, if if the intention is to trade, you would want some of that bounce pack performance. You, you figure he's coming right. off his worst season, and he's not going to ever uh, have a season that bad again. And but if again, that, if that was your intention, you know? I would guess if the offer is there that you know blows Chris away or you know knocks him over and says I can't pass it, then they actually they trade him. You know, I mean, there's yeah. again, you look at what you're going to have the next couple of years, and at least twenty five and maybe twenty six, you probably are not going to be a competitive. You know, I mean, Kansas City did show. Now, they did have three bad years before the 106 losses last year, yeah. but they did go from 106 losses to, you know, the cusp of the playoffs, maybe the playoffs. We'll see how the last week plays out. So yeah. you can't turn around, but I don't know if the Sox are in that position yet because there's just not a, enough position player talent to kind of fill it in yet, I think. <laughs> I love Luis, but he's not Bobby Wood Jr. I, 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 no, I, 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 you know, in, in fairness to Luis, who is, right? Who is? I mean, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Maybe O'Connor. Right. You know, Bobby, Bobby <laughs> can't pitch. That's right up Ju there. You know, like <laughs> Judge, Judge maybe is in there, and that's about it. You know, Bobby it. Witt's one of the best. There's no question. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, let's close this out with some fun stuff. I believe that you're a guy that likes to uh, go to Vegas at the end of the season. Uh, just okay. decomp decompress a little bit. Uh, where are some of your favorite places to stay, Merck, uh, when you're in Vegas? I'm a Vegas guy, too. I like going out to Vegas. It's a, it's a fun time. So, what, well, so like my, my cousins, my dad's brother... Sadly, they're both they're both not with us anymore. My dad and his brother, my uncle Al, uh, was a pediatrician out there for sixty years. So I've been going there since I was a young kid. You know, oh, okay. I, I I wasn't there the whole time he was a pediatrician, obviously. But you know, I've been going there where you went to shows and it was tipping the croupier to get the good seats, not Ticketmaster. So <laughs> right, I've old, stayed at pretty days. much every hotel. But now, as most baseball writers do, I have a ton of Marriott points. So 
I stay a lot at this one called the Marriott Chateau, which is yeah. kind of like a, a timeshare hotel combo right next to Planet Hollywood. But here's okay. the interesting thing. And I don't know if people know this. I'll provide a little information. Almost half the hotels on the strip are now owned by Marriott. Really? So like, uh, whatchamacallit, Bellagio is Marriott. MGM is Marriott. Mandalay Bay is Marriott. If you want to stay Luxor or Excalibur, good luck to you. They're, they're Marriott. So um, a lot of options now. So I, I've stayed pretty much. There's almost, there's very few hotels. If I haven't stayed there, I've pretty much chosen not to stay there, I think. So, <laughs> That's been on your own. Yeah, Caesars sorry, yeah. is great. Caesars is great for Old World Vegas. Yeah. Love Mandalay Bay. When I was younger, I used to stay at the Luxor a decent amount. I used to get a lot of upgrades there, so I like that one. Yeah. But but now it's more the Marriott part. There's a Marriott that I stay at, which uh, people don't get. But I stay. It's in uh, Summerlin. It's okay. at the Rampart Casino. It's a it's a resort. Now it's a little ways away. People, I think, when they think Vegas, they're like, you got to stay on the Strip, right? So no one gets that one. But that's that's right. another one I've stayed at. But now with so many options, I have to be able to find one on the Strip when I go out there. I love it. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize Marriott was the, the kind of the backing hotel chain of the of the. Uh, like the uh, the MGM uh, property, it just uh, it just became that like at some point this past year. Okay, all right. So it was not that very long. It was you know there were always Marriott properties out there. You know you can stay at the residence in two blocks from the football stadium or whatever if you want to do that. But yeah. um, now a lot of the main hotels have joined the Marriott Starwood chain there. Okay, interesting. Uh, machines or table games, Mark? If it's machines, it's video poker. Um, <laughs> What, any, any particular varietal of video poker that you like? No, you know, I like the basic one, maybe with the caveat of being able to double. They used to have that where if you win, yeah, you, you can, can, you you can, can play high-low to double <laughs> yeah. it. Yes. Of course, you win, like, you get a full house, and you win something good, and then you double it, and you lose, then you're pissed <laughs> you yourself, right? Yeah, but exactly. the, the, like, 10 play or 50 play is almost – too much for me at this point. I will tell you this: like this that's what I like, like, Mark. I like I like the ten play, and I like double super times pay. So I like that, or or ultimate X. But I feel like I lose my money fast at ultimate X. That's a and I see that. So Samina, you win a lot, right? You <laughs> I win, win some all the stuff. Time. I win occasionally. Yeah, yeah I win some stuff. Yeah. So I'll tell you a quick story. I was in Reno for my cousin Sarah's bat mitzvah. This is in 09, I think. Okay. And I, it was in the off season, so I stayed an extra day. I'd never been to Reno, so I'm playing blackjack at Harris for like an hour. I win 20 bucks and I'm like, I'm not going home up 20 bucks. I'm, I'm going to play this and see what yeah. I can do. So I go to one of those um, slot machines sink throughout the state of Nevada. The jackpot's like 13 million. I'm like, this is going to be great. I'm going to tell all my friends how I played 20 bucks and won 13 million. So I play slots. I don't like slots. They're mind numbing. I don't even get how you win on it. It's no longer the, you know, the cherries and the bells and right. whatever. It's a whole bunch of things. It's not the reals. Like, it's all this other shit. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I get up like 160 bucks. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to play down to 100 and then go home, 100-hour winner. Get down to 130, play it. Lights and bells start going off. It's going crazy. I know it's not the ultimate jackpot, but I'm thinking, what did I win? I think I won $2,900. Holy moly. So nice. That was pretty cool. <laughs> so I said now, off 20 bucks. <laughs> 2900 is too low to get a check, so they gave me $2,900 bills. So I'm walking back to my hotel literally with my hand on my wallet in my pocket like, <laughs> I might as well have yelled at everyone, hey, I have twenty nine hundred dollar bills in my wallet. Come stop by. <laughs> Come get me. Come find me. <laughs> exactly. I love it. Uh Mer Merck, what about uh what about dinner spots? Where uh where do you like to eat when you're in Vegas? Vegas, a lot of people who don't go to Vegas a lot don't know they have like uh the most world class restaurants anywhere on earth. Vegas basically. is I always say now Vegas is so different from when I was like a young kid there where I couldn't really do anything anyways, but you know, now it's like if you want to go and have a bachelor party weekend there and get a little wild, you can. You want to go and see sporting events and play golf, you can. When you want to go with your wife or girlfriend and have dinner and see shows, you can. Or you want to go with your family, you can. There's really something for everyone. I should work for the Vegas Tourist Bureau. <laughs> uh, I love Sinatra at, uh, I can't think where it's, I want to say Venetian or Palazzo. Is that the other, that's the one attached to the Venetian, I think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's on yeah. and win. So it's yeah, Venetian and Palazzo. Yep. I think it's at the Palazzo. It's great. I love the Rat Pack. I'm a big fan of the Rat nice. Pack. Love it. So there's a lot of cool stuff in there. The food's really good there. Delmonico's, which is a Emerald Lagasse place over the Venetian. Yep. That's really good. I'm trying to think of any other places. I mean, really, there's nothing bad there, you know? I, mean, I was going to say, there's I've great restaurants of, everywhere you walk. <laughs> yeah. Like every hotel, whether it's five-star or three-star, has a steakhouse and some sort of sushi place. 
the buffets are much less prevalent now after COVID, but yeah. Sinatra was my favorite. I love Sinatra. It's my favorite restaurant out there, I think. Beautiful. I'll have to try it. I I used to go to Carne Vino when it was in Palazzo, but that, that closed down. Okay. I used to like that place a lot. Currently, I like Amalfi in, in Caesars. I, uh, I've heard of that, that one, place. too. Yeah, it's, I've it's heard good. of that. <laughs> they have one in Caesars called Grand Lux Cafe. Have you ever been? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been to Grand Lux Cafe, but yeah, no, that's... <laughs> that's, that's now, I'm right. sure you can talk to 10 people and get 10 different recommendations for restaurants in Vegas, well, you know? That's why I wanted to bring it up, because I, I feel like it's such a, a vast uh, pool of restaurants, and, and right. everyone likes a little right. bit of something different. So, uh, well, Merck, thanks for sharing your thoughts on White Sox managers and clubhouse, the near future of the organization, and Vegas, baby, Vegas. We ain't trying to be right on this show. We're just trying to understand. Anything you want to plug before you go? No, I mean, you know, you can find me at Scott Merkin on Twitter. More importantly, at WhiteSox.com and MLB.com. I want to close with a quick story. I was walking back from the ballpark last night, going to get an Uber to my hotel, which is a little bit off the gas lamp area there. What a great area, by the way. What a great ballpark. Oh, it's awesome. San Diego. And there were like four or five White Sox fans walking towards me wearing jerseys. And I don't know if I knew the guy and just didn't recognize him or he knew me and he just looked at me and he goes, it's almost over, Merck. It's almost over. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, I mean, you know, I know it, it can get worse, but I feel like this is it. And it's incumbent on Chris and everyone else to not let it come close to this again with the White Sox. I absolutely agree. And, hope, and uh, fingers crossed that they, they do that job and take it seriously. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> take care, Merck. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate you. Anytime. Thank you. You got it. That was Scott Merkin. That was great. <laughs> that was terrific. Uh, next week's guest, uh, I'm going to have on someone uh, that I've been a fan of for a long time. I, I uh, subscribe to his newsletter, and that's Joe Sheehan. Uh, he's going to come on here. He was one of the people that uh, predicted the White Sox having kind of a rough year. He predicted uh, 54 and 108. He was a longtime baseball prospectus, Sports Illustrated. Now he has Joe Sheehan newsletter. Uh, just a, a legend uh, in the content game, the baseball content game. I'm really excited to have him on next week. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. I want to thank Punky's Pizza and Pasta and all the 108 families up in the YouTube comments. Appreciate you smashing the like button, comments, and, of course, drinks and tips. Uh, we'll see you next Monday with Joe Sheehan. And uh, make sure you show up for the 108 podcast Thursday night. We need you there, baby. Love you. Bye-bye.